Hello and welcome. First, I'd like to thank the library for having me here today. But just as important, all of you who were brave enough to show up to talk about the most haunted places in the Midwest from the safety of wherever you're watching this program. So with that, let's begin. Welcome to the hauntings of the Midwest. My name is Chad Lewis. I'll be your presenter for this program. And although my background is actually in the field of psychology, for the last 25 years I've been traveling the world in search of the strange and unusual. Everything from hunting for vampires over in Transylvania, looking for the Loch Ness Monster, crop circles, UFOs, alien abductions, really, really weird people, odd places, you name it, if it's just a little strange and offbeat, I've traveled around the globe in search of it. But for this program, we're going to talk about one of my favorite topics, and that is ghosts and haunted places. For the next 45 minutes, we're going to take a tour of the entire Midwest. I'm going to give you the background, the folklore, the eyewitness accounts. I'll talk a bit about some of the research we do at these locations. Heck, I'll even provide you with the directions to these places. But I'm going to leave it up to each and every one of you to travel to these places on your own and determine for yourself whether or not you believe they're haunted. But I have to warn you, whether you're a diehard skeptic or a true believer or somewhere in between, it's much easier watching these places on television than it is visiting. Because when you're out in the middle of nowhere and you see that shadowy thing moving from tree to tree, you simply can't turn to another channel and forget all about it. So with that in mind, let's explore some of the scariest places the Midwest has to offer. <laughs> a lot of people, when they think of a haunted place, they usually think of a cemetery. And the reason being is quite simple. Back when cemeteries were chosen, they were thought to be a portal between our world and the spirit world. So when your loved one passed on, it would just be easier for them to travel from our world to whatever world you believe they go to. But regardless of whether or not you believe this theory, there are many cemeteries where people think it's working in reverse. That the living are not moving into the spirit, but the spirit are coming into our world. First stop, Mount Carmel Cemetery in Hillside, Illinois, outside of Chicago. Many people know of this cemetery as being the final resting place of that little known gangster called Al Capone. And even though Capone's buried there, many people go to this cemetery for this statue. It's called the Italian Bride, and it involves a young woman in the early 1900s who, while giving birth, died during the labor process. And, as was the Italian custom of the time, she was to be buried in her wedding gown. But that's not the scary part. The scary part comes in the fact that as soon as she was buried, her mother began having dreams in which the daughter came to her and said, Mom, help me, dig me up, save me, I'm alive. So her mother did what any loving parent would do. She petitioned the church and the cemetery to get permission to dig up her daughter. And it worked. She got permission. The problem was it took her seven years to get this permission. But even so, she went ahead and dug up her daughter. And they were amazed to find that even though the casket was nearly rotted away, the young woman looked like she had been buried the day before. In fact, it was so creepy they said, hey, let's put that picture on the gravestone as well, which they did. You can see that after seven years, she looks like she's merely sleeping while the casket is not in good shape. Once stories started spreading about the condition of the body, people started seeing ghostly spirits in the cemetery. 
that often report seeing someone dressed in a bridal gown, thinking maybe she was someone paying her respects to her loved ones on her wedding day, they'd go and watch only to find that she would vanish right before their eyes and was nearly transparent the entire time. It's a great legend, it's great folklore, but is it anything more than that? Was anyone ever buried alive? Well, yes, we know thousands of people were buried alive. We know this because we have thousands of newspaper accounts from the late 1800s, early 1900s. Now back then, whether you were in a diabetic shock or in a coma, doctors would often pronounce you dead. But lo and behold, many people, some of which were even at their own funeral, would pop up just in the nick of time. This may seem a little silly today with modern science and medicine, but our grandparents were so afraid of being buried alive, they came up with several inventions. My favorite is this. It's called a cemetery bell, and it does or did exactly what it looks like it would do. It was a bell that would sit above your grave with a rope on a pole going down into your casket. So if you awoke in time to find yourself buried alive, all you'd have to do is tug that rope, it would ring the bell, and alert the caretaker who lived there that you had been buried alive and they could come and rescue you. But there was one problem with this invention though. On many nights the wind would set these bells off giving the caretaker quite a scare thinking everyone had been buried alive. It was also your responsibility to sit around the grave of your loved one watching to make sure that they were truly dead. This has given rise to the idea that cemeteries are haunted. And if we head to a small town in Iowa called Palo, you'll come to the Lewis Bottom Cemetery. Some call it the Palo Cemetery, but most know it as 13 Step Cemetery. The legend is when you go there during the day, there will be 12 steps guiding you up to the entrance. But if you go there at night, a mysterious 13th step will appear, beckoning you into this supernatural cemetery. For years, people have seen mysterious balls of light similar to these floating around in the cemetery, changing in size, shape, and color as they maneuver through the woods. But it gets even more sinister here because many people who come out to see ghosts at this very rural secluded cemetery often discover themselves face to face with what they were calling hellhounds. Large black dogs with glowing red eyes. Many believe they do the devil's bidding and that they are an omen of death. That if you see the hellhound, much like seeing or hearing the Irish banshee, it means you or someone you know is going to die very shortly. Unfortunately, many of the people who see it do not stick around long enough to find out what it truly is. But just to show you we're not the only weird people to believe in hellhounds, a few years ago I was over in the country of Belize. I was searching there for a jungle protector, a creature in the woods that they called the Tata Duende. And everywhere I went looking for this diminutive, backward-footed creature, villagers said, you better get back here before nightfall, because if you're not back before the sun goes down, you might encounter one of our hellhounds. They called them Cadeos. They believed that these things had supernatural powers, that they could take your life and connect with you and slowly steal your energy. And unless you could find a powerful shaman, or a bush doctor to remove the curse, you'd be dead within a week. So being the researchers that we were, we made it a point to stay out past dark every night, and luckily, knock on wood, I'm still here today. For the next case, it gets even more bizarre, and for that, we head right outside of Jackson, Minnesota, to a place called Loon Lake Cemetery. Except the locals, they don't call it Loon Lake. They call it Witch Cemetery. The legend goes, many years ago, a young girl by the name of Mary Jane was practicing witchcraft, the dark arts. So the community, in order to stop her from bringing evil to the 
town decided to take her life with an axe. And they buried her and the bloody axe out at a grave at Loon Lake Cemetery. And if there's any cemetery that looks like it should be haunted, it's this one. It's in the middle of nowhere. You have to go about a quarter mile on this makeshift trail until you get to the graveyard. And then you'll see that it's heavily neglected, vandalized, and abandoned. Graves are everywhere. It is said that the witch is buried in this grave. And there's a dare here as well. And the dare is that if you go out and jump over or walk over or touch the witch's grave, you'll be cursed with bad luck until the day you die. Every year I hear from a handful of people who report mishap, misfortune, or even death after visiting the witch's grave. When I first went there 20 plus years ago, I was very excited to take this there. But the problem is, we don't know which grave is the witch's. In fact, even the old plat books do not list who is buried where. Half the graves are estimated to be unmarked graves. Mary Jane, that alleged witch, her gravestone sits down at the local historical society's museum. They have it there for safekeeping believing that someone would try to steal it. In fact, many people believe there are as many as three witches buried out in this graveyard. But we don't know where they are. So when you go out there, you may want to keep an eye out as to which graves you're passing over to see if you're passing over the witch's grave. But of course, not everyone believes the place is haunted. You don't have to take my word for it. You don't have to take their word for it because the first thing you'll see when you get there is a sign saying no ghosts or witches exist in Loon Lake Cemetery. But again, you can take your own word for it because right outside of the cemetery is this small self-registering campground where you can spend the night all by yourself. It is so rural, nobody will bother you while you're there. At least not anyone who's alive. With Halloween fast approaching, many people ask me if I have a recommendation for a scary book. Something to get them into the mood for the fall and the season. And I do. I have a very scary book for you. Because if you think you're brave enough, if you think you have what it takes and not get scared, I dare any one of you to make it through the Sappy Love Story, Bridges of Madison County. This book was so scary they made a horror movie about it. But when you're done with the book and the movie, skip those and go to the Bridges of Madison County in Winterset, Iowa. More specifically, the Roseman Bridge. It was built in the 1800s and right away it took on a haunted reputation. Many legends abound about this place. One of the most prominent legends is that of a man who robbed a bank or was a general criminal. He went out to the bridge to escape, but the posse found him, threw up a rope, and took his life at the end of that rope in the bridge. Since that point, many people have seen a phantom hanging noose in the barn. Others say the man got away in a big boom when he just disappeared with a cannon-like noise. But since that time, Farmers had trouble moving over the bridge. Many of their horses refused to go over the bridge at night as though they were picking up on some unseen force. Others saw balls of light on the bridge as well. Others claim that when you go there you can hear the creaking of the noose and see the man hanging from the rafters. Unfortunately, you can no longer take your horse and buggy over the bridge but you can walk out there. Just be warned around dark is when all the bats that live in the bridge come out at night to feast, so make sure they're not feasting on you. If you happen to make your way to the twin cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minnesota, stop by my favorite restaurant in the state, a place called Four Paws Restaurant. It was once the home of Joseph Four Paws, a man who seemed to have everything life could offer. But that wasn't enough for Mr. Fourpaw. 
he took on a mistress, a housekeeper of his by the name of Molly. Of course, his wife found out about the affair and put an end to it. This was said to have set Forepaugh off on a spiral of depression that ended in 1893 when Forepaugh grabbed his pistol, went down to the train tracks, and put an end to his misery. Immediately, speculation turned to Molly that he, she was pregnant with Forepaugh's illegitimate child. Of course, no one would find out if this was true because soon after Forepaugh did himself in, Molly grabbed a rope, headed up to the third floor where the chandelier is, and took her life at the end of that rope. And now, if you want, the good news is, or maybe the bad news, I don't know your macabre sense of adventure, you can get seated right under that chandelier. Those who do often report the chandelier moves and sways on, it own, on its own. Others have seen the ghostly image of a woman hanging from the roof. Others will be eating when all of a sudden they see the ghostly image of a man walking through the place and vanishing into the wall. He's always reported to be an arrogant looking man walking through the place as though he owns it. Well, if it's the ghost of Forepaw, he does own the place, or at least he once did. Staff members I interviewed told me that before a big event, they would often set up the silverware and the dishware, only to come in the next morning to find it rearranged by some unseen hand. Oftentimes, silverware just materializes out of nowhere and drops to the ground. Many of the staff told me they'd rather be fired than to work alone up on the third floor because that's where a lot of the activity takes place. They believe the ghosts are that of Joseph and Molly continuing their ill-fated love affair even from the grave. Believe it or not, this is the most common question I get received. I, I get asked, where can I go to spend the night in a haunted place? Well, Again, if you have that macabre sense of adventure, you're in luck because the Midwest is filled with haunted places for you to tuck in for the night. If you head to Milwaukee, you'll come to one of my favorite places, the Ambassador Hotel. Today, it's a very fine establishment. High-end, luxury, you'll love it. But back in the 70s and 80s, it was a cesspool. They rented the place out to criminals, drug dealers, pimps, prostitutes, even the occasional serial killer would stay there. This is Jeffrey Dahmer, the cannibal of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Dahmer spent many nights staying at the Ambassador. One night, back in 1987, he went out drinking and brought this man back to his room. There they drank the night away. When Dahmer woke up in the morning, the man was dead and Dahmer claimed he had no recollection as to what had happened. But instead of going to the police and explaining the accident, he did what most of us would do. He went out and bought the biggest trunk he could find, came back, chopped the man up, put him in the trunk, and then brought it to his grandmother's house where he lost track of it. Nobody knows what happened to it. Maybe it's in your basement or your attic right now. But since that time, many people have had odd experiences at the hotel. Sometimes people call down to the front desk complaining that the guests next to them sound like they're fighting to their death. Even though many times the staff have to tell them there's no one in the room next to you. Others see what appears to be the ghostly image of a man covered in blood walking through the hallways and vanishing into thin air. Many believe it's the victim or victims of Dahmer. We're not sure how many people he actually may have killed at the ambassador. Others have claimed to see Dahmer himself walking through the old lobby. But again, it's an upscale place. They don't like talking about the Dahmer history, as you can imagine why. But you can enjoy the beauty of Milwaukee, all while getting a taste of its grisly history. Does anyone recognize this location in Iowa? Sorry, bad joke, cornfield in Iowa, but you will recognize this place when I tell you this is the exact spot where music died. 1959, Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and J.P. Richardson, the big bopper, 
We're all playing the winter dance party at the Surf's Ballroom in downtown uh, Clear Lake, Iowa. Beautiful historic place. They finished their show and Buddy Holly was upset because their tour bus kept breaking down on them. So he hired a plane to take him and two other artists to their next gig in the Fargo, North Dakota area. But they didn't get there and the investigators didn't have to search very far because the next morning when they didn't arrive a search party was sent out and just north of Clear Lake they found the wreckage of the plane. All three of the young artists passed away along with the young inexperienced pilot. Several years later they put a makeshift memorial to the artist out at the site and if you walk down the path you'll come to the spot where they died. Many people take comfort and solace in the fact that the music of these artists will live on forever. Others believe it's more than the music that lives on because they'll go out there and hear the sounds of phantom music being played but nothing is around. Others hear the sound of what appears to be a plane crashing into the field but when they look around they're surrounded by nothing but fields. But my favorite stories come from unsuspecting motorists traveling down the gravel road here when all of a sudden they see someone on the side of the road thinking they may need assistance or help they slow down only to find themselves face to face with what appears to be the ghost of Buddy Holly himself complete with his trademark eyeglasses. He often vanishes right into thin air. Well if it is the ghost of Buddy Holly he seems to be busier in death than he was in life because several places around the U.S. claim to be the final resting place of Buddy Holly's ghost, including the Surf Ballroom. Believe it or not, many people like to go to places where tragedies have taken place. One such location that gives you that opportunity is in Villisca, Iowa better known as the Villisca Axe Murder House. This is the home of J.B. Moore and his family. Back in 1912, J.B. Moore and the family, along with two family friends that were staying over, were out and about during the day. While they were gone, it's believed that someone or several people snuck into their home, waited up in the attic or a closet for the family to come home. And when they did, the family, one by one, was killed with an axe. The next morning, when the usually rambunctious family was nowhere to be found, neighbors thought it was suspicious. They came into the house and discovered the grisly remains. The police were called in. The police had no idea how many bodies they were dealing with, whether it was one or ten because they were in such terrible condition. But the townsfolk didn't wait for the conclusion of the investigation. They tracked bloody footprints through the place. Even the murder weapon was stolen as a grisly souvenir. Now the place is open for you to rent it out for the night and spend the evening. Those who do often report odd things taking place. They'll often hear the giggling and playing of children. Others will hear the sound of somebody walking through the place even though no one else is there. Others claim to see the ghostly image of a man carrying a hatchet or an axe through the building as well. Again, you can spend the night there if you choose. They also have a daytime tour. If you'd rather not spend the night, you can take the daytime tours. I get just as many reports from daytime tours as people spending the night. Most commonly, children will see what appears to be someone dressed in a period costume walking down the small steps getting back to the main floor. They often ask who's the tour guide on the steps only to find there is no tour guide there on the steps. You can also go out to the cemetery to see where the family is buried and pay your respects as well. This next case brings us to Illinois, right outside of Cambridge, is one of the worst cases I've ever encountered. It's a place called Death Curve. 
And it got its name because for many years the legend was and is that if you drive out to Death Curve, you will see the ghost of a woman carrying an axe who will crash you off the road and you'll crash and die. Hence the term Death Curve. For years no one knew why this woman might be out there on her own. Doing research, we discovered that many years ago, the Markham family farmed out on this land. And in the early 1900s, the young wife, Julia Markham, went crazy. She lost her mind, snapped, went psychotic. She sent her two oldest and strongest children out to fetch water and wood for the day. When they were gone, one by one, she invited her five smallest children into the house where she took an ax to them and ended their lives. When the two oldest children came back, they were treated to the same behavior. Julia, in a matter of moments, had snapped and killed all seven of her children. She then tried to commit suicide by cutting her own throat, but the knife was too dull, so she gathered what she could of her children up, poured coal oil all over them and herself, and lit their place on fire like this home. Neighbors caught wind of the fire, literally, came over in time to see the bodies inside with young Julia walking out like a charred Freddy Krueger. She immediately blamed it on a traveling salesman, but before she died, she admitted to the ghastly deed. Since that time, people have gone out and seen odd things on the farmstead. Many balls of light seem to follow the fence line and these old posts. People will see them disappear. Last time I went there, I brought my axe, hoping to entice the spirit of Mrs. Markham. Luckily or unluckily for me, she did not appear. Others claim that if you walk back to where the farmstead was, the ghostly spirit of the house will appear. The legend is, is if you're brave enough to go into the house, you will never return. I've talked to several people who claim that they've seen the house, but they were too frightened to go inside. I've not spoken to anyone who has ventured into the ghostly house because, of course, they wouldn't come out to tell me about it. Right down the road from the old Markham estate is the town's cemetery. And it's here that Mrs. Markham and her children are buried. All the children are buried in an unmarked grave right here, and the mother is buried in an unmarked grave right next to them. Which may be the reason why many people who are going out to the cemetery report seeing the ghostly images of young children playing around at the cemetery, wondering why they're there in the middle of the night or why they're not properly dressed for the weather conditions. These kids simply vanish right before their eyes. Others hear the giggling and playing of the children as well. One of the first cases I ever investigated was a case I'm still working on today. Right outside of my hometown of Eau Claire, Wisconsin, is a place called Elk Lake. And this is Elk Lake Dam. One night, two men were sitting here. Don't worry, there's nothing to see in this photo. But they were sitting right here one night, just watching the beautiful area, when all of a sudden one of them turned around and noticed what appeared to be a glowing woman in white standing behind him. He nudged his buddy and said, hey, do you know there's a glowing woman standing behind us? His buddy said, yep, but I'm too afraid to turn around and look. About a half hour went by, they finally turned around and noticed that she was gone. So were the two men. They hightailed it out of there as fast as they could. One of them was so frightened, he refused to bring us back to where the incident took place. The other one did. Now at the time, I was a student studying psychology at UW-Stout. One of the cohorts in my program was uh, named Aaron. He believed he was psychic or intuitive. He could pick up these spirits. So I brought him along on the investigation. When we got there, we wanted to take a photo of where the two men would have been sitting that night. But you can see Aaron's camera malfunctioned. It worked before. It worked after, but it would not work during that moment. My camera did take a photo. And when we had the film come back, back when people actually used film, you'll notice this weird mist or fog 
right where the two men saw the woman. It wasn't visible with the naked eye, but it appeared on the film. So I started talking about this case quite a bit at conferences. After one program, a gentleman came up to me and told me that he lived in that area in the 1970s. He recalled there was a murder out there, but that's all he could remember. So I started digging through the old newspaper archives, day by day, searching for a murder out there. I started in the year 1970. By the time I hit the year 1974, I realized the man was right. There was a murder out there, a young woman. And not just any nameless, faceless young woman, but this young woman. Her name was Mary. She was hitchhiking from Minneapolis to Chicago when she was picked up by this gentleman who was last seen kicking something on leaves and dirt over something on the side of the road. Neighbors thought it was suspicious in this very rural area, so they called the police. By the time the police arrived, the man was gone and the body of Mary was on the ground dead. And even though they had a witness description of the man, he was never captured and the case went unsolved. Well now, I decided to go back to that place because if it was haunted, maybe it was haunted because of that woman. So I went back, I brought Aaron the psychic with me again. He wanted me to take a photo of this pillar, which I did. Took dozens that night of the pillar. The only thing out of the weird, out of the ordinary, was this weird mist or fog-like substance that we couldn't see with the naked eye. It was also on this night we heard what sounded like a woman screaming from up on top of the bridge. But even though we thought it might have been a woman, it didn't sound quite human, but it didn't sound like a recording either. As we were leaving, Aaron believed the spirit of Mary was going to follow us back to campus. So we took one last snap of a photo, and I'll let you decide whether she was following us back, because when the film came back, this is what appeared on the film. Many people have seen weird shapes, images, and faces in this photo. Didn't know it at the time, but you could write an entire book about this area, from phantom hitchhikers, to possession, to suicides, and a murdering father and son who lived out there as well, burying people on their swamp. A few years ago, they dug up the body of the young woman, looking for DNA evidence, hopefully trying to capture this gentleman. They did not find any, and the case remains unsolved. If you thought these cases were weird, and granted they were, these next cases are going to be beyond bizarre. For that, we head right outside of Fort Dodge, Iowa, to a place called Terra. This is Terra Bridge, out on the outskirts of nowhere. And it's here weird things seem to take place. It's here that people claim the bridge is haunted by a phantom train. Because many years ago, a man lost his life while working as a railroad worker, hitting spikes into the ground. The spikes then snapped out at him and decapitated him. Many people refused to go over the bridge at night because of all the haunted activity. What you would think were, you know, strong, sturdy railroad workers refusing because they'd see a ball of light. They could hear the train. They could see the light coming, they could feel the rumbling, but it never arrived. I have stories dating back to the 1800s about ghost hunters going out to the area to experience the legend. But these stories often progress and change and move. And the story has changed. Now the story people know about the Bantwell Bridge is that Many people claim the story of a young woman who went crazy, was distraught, took her young children out to the bridge and waited. And she waited. Eventually a train came rumbling by and one by one she tossed her children over the edge till they met their fate. When they were disposed of, she too jumped over and joined them in death. And now the story tells that when you go out to the bridge, and when you park your car on the bridge, not only will you see the ghost 
of the young children, but you might encounter the ghost of that murdering mother as well. The dare is that if you park your car on the bridge and do not lock your doors and windows, the spirit of that murdering mother will try to throw you over the bridge as well. The last time I went there, I was joined by noted researchers Noah Boss and Kevin Lee Nelson. They were up above here, I was down below. Not only did they not lock their doors and windows, they moved over to the side. They were up above hoping that the ghost would try to throw them over. I was down below filming, praying that she would throw them to their death, but unfortunately she did not show up. But dating back to that same 1800s time period, all the way up to modern day stories, tells of a creature roaming the area that shouldn't be there. A creature that couldn't be there. Yet, when people look, they're face to face with, well, maybe I better let you just take a look. This creature, for lack of a better term, they call it a werewolf. They said it was the size of a bear, but shaped more like a wolf, with the long muzzle and the deep, dark, matted down fur. And these stories are all over the Midwest. Thanks to my good friend and colleague, Linda Godfrey, Wisconsin, my home state, is now known as the werewolf capital of the world. It all began when Linda was working as a journalist in southeastern Wisconsin. Started receiving reports of people traveling down a small stretch of road called Bray Road. There, usually at night, but not always, people would see a giant figure on the side of the road. Sometimes it was eating roadkill or freshly killed prey. But the good news is that outside of charging at a couple vehicles, most claim that this creature, which walks and runs upright like a human, is just as afraid of people as they are of it. And rather than attack, it seems to prefer to scurry back into the woods and remain undetected. So the good news is, if you go looking for these creatures, whether it's on Bray Road or out at Terror Bridge, most likely you won't die. Well, 50-50, well worth a try. But keep in mind that not all monsters tend to look like this. In fact, some monsters look a little bit more like this. This is Ed Gein. If you don't recall Ed's story back in the 1940s and 50s, you might recall some of the movies they based on his life, including that of Psycho, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Silence of the Lambs, and many, many others. Now, most people just recall Ed as a murderer, and true he was. He killed two people that we know of, probably half a dozen more, including his own brother. But before he was captured, he was well-liked in Plainfield. Odd, but well-liked. He would often babysit for kids, and he'd bring his neighbors over what he called a venison stew for them to eat. One neighbor told me he remembered as a young boy getting his mother getting this stew from Ed, and it had such a horrible smell she threw it away. Which is a good thing, because even though Ed was a murderer, his real passion was to wait until it got dark. Then he would fire up his vehicle, head down to the nearby cemeteries where he would dig up the remains of women that reminded him of his own deceased mother. He would then bring those remains back to his farmhouse where he lived in squalor and he would use them for lampshades and furniture throughout his place. He had skulls all over the house. When he really got a bug in his system, Ed would make an entire outfit of this material and wear it like a demented Halloween costume as he danced under the moonlight in his yard. But you see, when we finally caught Gein and discovered how truly horrific his crimes were, they wanted to open his house as a museum of horrors that you could pay to go see. But before they were able to do so, it mysteriously caught fire and burned to the ground. Townsfolk torched it, allegedly. But even though Gein's farm is no longer there, many believe he was so evil he had forever cursed the town of Plainfield, Wisconsin. And maybe they're right. There are many places associated with Gein 
that are thought to be haunted, including the old cemeteries where he actually dug up his victims and is buried right next to some of those victims as well. People will go out to the cemetery and see what appears to be a man digging a grave by hand. Yet when they get closer, the man simply isn't there, vanished into thin air. Others hear weird noises by the old Gein gravesite. Gein's grave is no longer there. They removed it because people kept stealing it. But you can see uh, people leave trinkets and all kinds of things at his gravesite. Others believe the old hardware store where Miss, Mr. Gein killed Mrs. Warden is haunted. For many years it served as a hardware store. Staff members told us that often they'd be putting out inventory when things would move on their own. Or they'd see what appeared to be a woman come into the store going to offer to assist her only to find she vanished and walked right into a wall. Others heard the sound of a rifle going off in the store as well. Of course this is what Gein killed Mrs. Warden with. A few years back the place was put for sale, abandoned. If you're looking to own a piece of unique history or grisly history, you may want to purchase it. And of course, many people want to go to the old Gein farmstead. As you saw, the house is no longer there, but many believe the spirit of Gein is there. Not only have people heard the cries thought to be his victims ringing out from the land, others claim that they've come face to face with Gein himself while walking on the old estate. If you are going to go there, don't do so on Halloween. You'll probably end up getting more of a trespassing ticket than a haunted experience. But as I'm running low on this program, I want to end on the type of case that I receive the most often. Without a doubt, the overwhelming majority of haunted stories I receive are not of serial killers, untimely deaths, suicides, or accidents. It's people who think their home is haunted. Whether it's haunted by a relative of them smelling grandpa's cigar smoke on his anniversary of his death, or their aunt's of perfume on her birthday, or haunted by somebody who lived there previously, or somebody they have no idea who's haunting it. Again, the overwhelming majority of people that have a haunting, it involves their house. So I want all of you to keep that in mind as later when you all put your head down on your pillows and you hear the wind rustling outside your window, I want you to ask yourself, is it possible just maybe that that's not the wind howling outside your window. And with that, if you want more information, you can go to my website, chadlewisresearch.com. You'll find more than you could ever want or need on the site. But I hope your adventure doesn't end here today with this program. Grab one of my books. Go on your own adventure of the Midwest. And when you do, I think you'll discover that we live in one heck of a weird area. Along the way, you're going to see some weird people. You'll uh, meet all kinds of oddities along the way. And you might just discover that the scariest thing out there is often yourself. So with that, I want to once again thank the library for having me here. Even in these times we're living in, it's important that storytelling continues. And I haven't thought of a time in history when the library's been as important as it is today. With everything going on with the pandemic, society, the politicians, libraries are the fabric that keeps the community together. They're a real treasure for whatever community's lucky enough to have them. So if you like programs like this, let them know so you get more of these. If you didn't like this program, let them know so you get fewer of these. But either way, they put a ton of work into getting me here, and they should be applauded, and thank you all for coming. 